Oh yes, let's begin. So last class we looked at the doctrine of God, but then we left out one aspect of his nature, uh, his triune nature, because we wanted to discuss that in greater detail. So um, you will find a few brief notes in your, you know, the notes which have been given to you. Uh, but then I would be covering a whole bunch of stuff which is not mentioned in your notes. So if you would like to, you can take down notes. Uh, you know, write down your written, handwritten notes, or you can always just watch the video, and all the information that you require will be there in the video anyway. So uh, we'll get started with our doctrine of Trinity. As you know, this is a very unique concept um, that you find only in uh, the Bible, where it is talking about God being three, but He is one in three persons. Did you say something? What, what would I need? I need to mute my laptop thing. It's unmuted. Even my laptop is unmuted. Should I mute my laptop? Does that help? I can go ahead. Okay. Thanks a lot. Ouch. Now I'm going to get this feedback. Is it? Okay. okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so what was I saying? Yeah. We, we In the Bible, you have this concept of God being one, but he is one in three persons. And it's not something that we quite understand because we humans have not been created that, like that. And so we don't understand things which are beyond uh, what is human. So it is difficult for us to grasp. Also, we uh, observe that the word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. We don't have any verse in the Bible which says, behold, I am Trinity. You know, so it, it is no such uh, verse in the Bible. The scholars came up with this term to try and explain what they are observing about God in the Bible. Because when they were looking at the Bible, they noticed that there are three persons of the Godhead being mentioned. But at the same time, there are verses which clearly say God is one. So they were trying to um, uh, come up with a word which will try to explain the oneness of God and at the same time express the fact that this one God uh, is three persons. So they came up with a word, uh, you know, um, tri-unity to express uh, oneness, but there are three in the oneness. So they came up with the term tri-unity, which you know, later on became trinity. That's how we got the word trinity. And it's just trying to express the fact that God is completely one. I mean, utterly, totally one. But that oneness is expressed in three different persons. So uh, that uh, they try to bring out that concept using this particular term trinity. And um, in the Old Testament times, the people were not very, very clear about this whole uh, idea of Trinity. They just mainly thought of the Lord as Yahweh. They never really thought about him as three persons. Uh, so they didn't have a very clear picture. But we do find many, many uh, Bible verses in the Old Testament which express this triune nature of God. It's just the people at, at that time did not re really have a clear picture. So we are very familiar with, you know, with the verses which everyone mentions with regard to the Trinity, Old Testament. Um, uh, we have Genesis 1.26, where the Lord says, let us make man in our image. So over there, um, God is speaking among the persons of his triune being. And he's saying, let us together make God in our image. Then you have Genesis 3.22, um, where, um, you know, the Lord says, man has become like one of us. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that would be Genesis 3.22. Then we have Isaiah 6.8, uh, where you have the Lord speaking and the Lord says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Okay. So, first he says, whom shall I send? And then uh, he, he says, who will go for us? So again, over there, the triune nature of God is uh, being mentioned. So the people of the Old Testament were aware 
that these verses existed, but I'm not sure to what extent they really thought about these wordings. I don't know whether they really understood why this us is being used again and again. And actually, it is expressing the three persons who are there you know, in the one God. So um, there are scriptures in the Old Testament which bring out this concept. We also have Psalm 110, verse 1. Now that, if someone could read out. Psalm 110, verse 1, please. Yeah, so here uh, you have L O R D in caps. Okay, uh, all the four alphabets are in capital letters. So, uh, you know, like we had discussed earlier, that would mean that the word Yahweh is being translated. So, the Lord over here is Yahweh. So, Yahweh says to my Lord. Now, the second Lord over there, you have the capital L. But then the O, R, D are in small alphabets. So that would be your Adonai. Okay, so the Hebrew wording would actually be Yahweh says to my Adonai. Okay, so, um, so obviously Yahweh is God who is being talked about over here. And God is saying, you know, this is David talking. So David is talking, he's writing down this psalm and he says, Yahweh says to my Lord, to my Adonai. Okay, so whom is he talking about? If you look at the next few verses in Psalm 110, we see that he's talking about the Messiah who's going to come one day. So he's talking about the Messiah as my Lord. Okay, so, and he's using the term Adonai. Now, when we come to the New Testament, Jesus Christ quotes the same verse. And in the New Testament, um, maybe if someone could read out Matthew chapter 22, verses 43 to 46. And it's interesting to see the, you know, um, the point that is being made over here. Matthew chapter 22, verses 43 to 46, if someone could read out. Yeah, and then uh, forty five and forty six. All right, so uh, in the Old Testament. The wording was Yahweh says to my Adonai. And over here it's David, he's saying, you know, uh, Yahweh is saying to my Lord, to my Adonai, sit at my right hand. Now Jesus is quoting this in the New Testament. In the New Testament, uh, the wordings were all in Greek. So obviously they could not bring in that Hebrew word and put it over there. So the word Yahweh is not mentioned uh, in the Greek Bible. Uh, so the word kurios is used. So the word kurios basically is similar to Adonai. It will be, you know, Lord, Master. Um, and um, so here in Matthew 22, verse 44, Jesus is quoting and he says, the Lord said to my Lord. Okay. And then he goes on to ask the question, why was David calling one of his future descendants, you know, the Messiah who's going to come in his lineage, why is he calling this future descendant of his as Lord? You know, you would say, my, 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 my son, maybe that's the term that you would use. Uh, you know, Yahweh said to my son, son as in a descendant of mine. But he doesn't use the uh, term son. He says, the Yahweh says to my master, to my Lord. And so Jesus asks them this question because you see they're kind of um, uh, saying that, Jesus is not Lord. And so Jesus says, if that is the case, then why? Why is David referring to me as his Lord? Does that not mean that I am divine? Is the question that he is asking. And then it says in verse 46, no one could say a word in reply. When Jesus poses this question and says, you know, why, why is David calling his descendant his Lord instead of just saying, you know, my son? 
so when they ask that when jesus asks that question the people they do not say anything in reply so there is this argument which is made by some people about psalm 110 verse 1 they argue and they say you know when uh, david was talking about my adonai he was talking about a human master a human uh, uh, lord because in that uh, in, in those days the word lord was even used you know for uh, you know humans so uh, so they say david was just talking about some human adonai he was not talking about a divine adonai and uh, so they try to dilute what is being said in psalm 110 but when you look at matthew 22 and the way jesus interprets it he is using the word kurios for both you know he sings the the, the kurios said to my kurios and both of them mean the word lord and the listeners who are listening very clearly understand that he's not talking about a human master at all. They clearly understand that he is talking about a divine Lord. And they understand that David, when he was talking at that time, he was not talking about a human Adonai. He was talking about a divine Lord. And so they don't reply back to Jesus and say, ah, no, no, no. Actually, David meant it like that. They all know what David meant. David was talking about how Yahweh said to his divine Adonai, sit at my right hand. They all know that that is the correct interpretation of Psalm 110. And so they keep their mouths shut. They do not reply back to Jesus and say anything. They don't contradicting, contradict him. And so in our Matthew 22, verse 44, when it says, the kurios said to my kurios, both the kurios over there, both the lords mentioned over there, they are divine. That is what is being talked about over there. So in the Old Testament, there was always this understanding that um, the one whom they know as Yahweh is Lord. He is divine. But there is also this Messiah who is going to come and he also will be Lord. He also will be divine. They, they always did have that understanding. And then we have one more scripture maybe which we could you know, just refer to, uh, which would be Isaiah 63 verse 10 where it talks about how the people rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So over there, the Holy Spirit is being referred to as the Holy Spirit of Yahweh himself. So in that sense, the Holy Spirit is also divine. So there are scriptures in the Old Testament talking about um, how Yahweh is actually three um, persons. And all these three persons have divinity. All three of them are divine. Coming to the New Testament, again, we have a whole bunch of scriptures which talk about, um, you know, all the three persons of the Godhead being divine. Uh, they're, they're mentioned together, um, you know, in, in different Bible passages. Just to give you some, you know, um, scriptures, Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. Um, we have uh, one spirit being mentioned, then one God and Father of all being mentioned, and you have one Lord being mentioned. So you have the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord, and also God the Father being mentioned in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. Maybe we could read out 1 Peter 1, verse 2. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Yeah. Okay, so over here in 1 Peter 1, 2, uh, you have all the three persons of the Godhead uh, working together to help in the redemption plan for mankind. Oh, so you have God the Father who had foreknowledge. He planned all that he would be doing for humanity to redeem them. So he is the, he's the one with the foreknowledge. He decides what would be done. And then uh, it is the... Holy Spirit who carries out this uh, work, you know, after Jesus Christ has finished his work on the cross, the Holy Spirit continues that work of sanctification. And why are the Father and the Holy Spirit doing this? They are doing so that everything can be brought under the dominion of Jesus Christ, who will be made Lord over all. So it's not only God the Father who is Lord over all, 
even Jesus Christ is Lord over all because both of them, the God, the Father and, and the Holy Spirit are over here working together to bring everyone under obedience to Jesus Christ. OK, who actually did that work of redemption on the cross uh, when he shed his blood. So we see all the three persons of the Trinity participating in the redemption plan. Um, we also have Jude chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, uh, where it talks about, uh, it, it urges the people to pray in the Holy Spirit. And why are they praying in the Holy Spirit? So that they can keep themselves in God's love, you know, to remain in God's love. And um, uh, then it goes on to say, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. So the Lord Jesus Christ has shown his mercy and uh, because he has shown his mercy, we take that privilege and we choose to keep ourselves in God's love. How do we do that? We do it by praying in the Holy Spirit. OK, so uh, we have again this, uh, the, all the three persons of the Trinity being mentioned over here. So when we look at all of the scriptures, we, we if we gather all the scriptures which are there in the Bible about the Trinity, and if we put all of them together, three main points come out. The first point that we have to accept is that God is three persons. God is one, but he in that oneness, there are three persons. So that's one basic fact which comes out very, very correctly and very, very strongly. And um, um, if we look at John 3, 16, you know, which is a very familiar verse, over there it talks about how God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In some versions it would say, uh, God sent his one and only son. Um, and yeah, he just. Yeah, so it, uh, because there are scriptures which say God is one. So he's most definitely, if you're, if you're doing a count, it would only be one. So if, if I have, uh, you know, uh, three persons standing in front of me, I would count them as one, two, three. But then if I have to count God and he comes and stands in front of me, he doesn't need to. But if he were standing there, I would, if I, when I'm counting, I would only be able to count one being because he is literally one. But that in that oneness, there are three. And it does not give the details, the technical details in the Bible of how that is possible. But when you, if, you're doing a, if, you're, if you're doing a head count, God would only count as one. So we, yeah, we, that's something that we would have to you know, accept. So here in John 3, 16, it's talking about how God uh, so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, or he sent his one and only son. So if God is sending his son, it literally means that there are two persons over there. OK, so uh, he is one in his being, but he is sending someone out. So he is in heaven and he's sending someone out to the earth. So we cannot just say, oh, God and Jesus are the same. Because we see one, uh, we see the Godhead being there, continuing to be over there in heaven. But that God is sending someone into the earth who's actually going to be living in the earth for a number of years. So we have to admit that God and the Son are two separate persons. But there are verses which say that he is one as a being. So it is a controversy to us in our minds, in our thinking, simply because we humans have not been created in that way. So it is, we find it difficult to comprehend. But it is important to accept these things by faith as the truth, because the scriptures says that. In the same way, when you go to uh, John 14, 26, if someone could read out John 14, 26 for us, please. So over here, um, Jesus is speaking and he says, the Father will send in my name the Holy Spirit. 
so now you have jesus and god the father together sending a third person you know to us believers uh, to indwell us and to sanctify us to and to guide us into this redemption which jesus christ has won so here again we see that there are three distinct persons because uh, in the in the, at first you had father sending the son now you have father and son together sending the holy spirit so they are functioning as three separate persons so we have to accept that they are distinct they are separate from one another we can't just say oh you know it's just sometimes god appears as a father and sometimes he makes his appearance as a son and sometimes he appears as a holy spirit no they are three separate persons but we always have to come back to all the verses which talk about how god is one okay so um, we cannot just cancel out that the, those verses and another aspect of trinity is we we discover when we look at all these scriptures we understand that each of these three persons is fully god so it's not like if you have a cake uh, a birthday cake and you cut it into three portions and you say ah this is first portion of the cake this is the second portion of the cake and this is the third portion of the cake so what are you doing with the cake you are actually dividing it into three portions and you're saying this is one portion of the cake so if i were to pick up that one portion and i were to give it to ren then she would say you're giving me one portion and i tell her this is the cake this is the birthday cake she say this is not the birthday cake this is just one portion of the birthday cake so you see there are parts and there is the whole the full now what we are saying about this divine being this one god is that if i were to place the holy spirit in front of us he is not one portion of the of the godhead he is fully completely absolutely god is completely god if i were to place god the father in front of us it's not that he's just one portion of the godhead he is fully completely god is so please bear with me i'm trying to explain in human terms to humans about something which is not at all remotely human we are discussing someone who is completely unique someone who is completely other and i'm trying to use ordinary words to express that and obviously we are not going to quite catch it um uh, but we have to accept that there are verses which talk about him being completely one and there are verses which seem to be talking about him you know uh, operating as three persons so it's just something that we try to grasp and we to the extent possible uh, you know we make that part of our doctrine so let us not just ignore this and leave it out of our doctrine just because we are not able to catch it all in the old testament times a lot of uh, the you know true followers of yahweh they held on to a lot of doctrine which they never really understood at all now we are we who are living in new testament times we are able to understand oh messiah was actually this 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 he was actually meant to accomplish this 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 they never understood a lot of things but they held on to it faithfully so now we who are in the new testament times even though we don't quite understand this doctrine let us faithfully in faith believe it and hold on to it because who knows when we get over there to heaven maybe we will be given some more details i think nobody will ever be able to completely understand god because you would need to have an infinite mind to understand infinity and uh, we created beings whether we are angels or humans will always be finite so but maybe we will get a clearer understanding you know maybe we'll have a session over there on doctrine of trinity in heaven and when we all sitting in that classroom we will be able to understand better but right now let's adjust with because i have a lot of puzzled people looking at me and it makes me feel so unhappy because i like explaining things clearly but you know let's do the best that we can with whatever information we have right now which god in his wisdom decided to give to us now later on he may give us additional information so good when that happens you know let's enjoy that additional information at the moment we have to accept that each of these three persons in the godhead are fully completely god they're not just one portion of godhead each of them is completely fully god some verses which talk about uh, you know each of the persons of the godhead being fully divine um, philippians 1 2 can be the verse that we could take for god the father 
um, and if we could just have someone read out Philippians chapter 1, verse 2. Here, uh, it very clearly says, God, our Father. So it's talking about uh, the Father God. And the Father God is referred to very clearly over here as God, our Father. Now, I really don't know how many of these scriptures are there in your uh, you know, notes. So in case you would like to jot down these verses, even as they're being given, you know, you can always jot it down. Now, God, the Son, a scripture, a couple of scriptures which really bring out uh, the divinity of Jesus Christ so beautifully. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, if someone could read out. I really love the way Jesus is being described over here. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Jesus is referred to as our great God. No doubt about his divinity, okay? He is our great God. And Colossians 2, 9 also makes a powerful statement. If someone could read out Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. So even though Christ, when he was on the earth, he was in bodily form, all the fullness of the deity was living in him. Okay, so that's so clearly stated. Um, then moving on to the Holy Spirit, uh, there's one passage uh, which is very clear. Uh, which places the Holy Spirit on equal position with God the Father uh, and, and no Jesus Christ. Uh, that would be Acts chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. It's like a portion from a story. We will obviously not get into the entire story, but just to read that, that one portion, Acts chapter 5, 3 to 4. Okay, so here uh, we have an interesting story happening, which we will not uh, discuss. Uh, but you know, most of us must be already familiar with it. But look at the wording over here. In uh, verse three, Peter says to Ananias, uh, "You know, Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit." So he says to him, Ananias, "You know what? You are lying to the Holy Spirit." And then when we look at the last portion of verse four. There, Peter is saying, you have not lied just to human beings, but to God. So the Holy Spirit is being addressed as God, fully God. So in, in no way is he a lesser being uh, than uh, the rest of himself, the rest of um, the Godhead. Okay, So he is fully God. The Holy Spirit is also fully God. So... The first main point which comes out is that we have to accept the fact that this one God is in three persons, is in the form of three persons. The second fact that we have to accept is that each of them has been described in the Bible as being fully God. And the third thing, you know, coming back to the fundamental uh, fact, God is one. Uh, because this is something that God says about himself. He declares that about himself. He doesn't want anyone to have any doubts about his being one single being. So maybe one verse that we can look at regarding that would be Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6. So if someone could read out Isaiah 45, 5 and 6. Okay, so he says, I am the Lord and there is no other. And over there, he's addressing himself as one, one Lord. Okay, so uh, we have to accept that there is only one Lord. But that one Lord uh, is has three persons. 
Okay, so that's just uh, um, uh, uh, something that we that we find pu puzzling. Now, what does Jesus say about the Trinity? Um, before we look at uh, the the quotation which Jesus uses, uh, you know, just to look at the background of the quotation which Jesus quotes, uh, that would be uh, the Shema. I'm not sure whether if you you heard that term before. Uh, it is something that the Jewish people would be very, very familiar with because every single day uh, they would recite the Shema. I don't know whether they meant it as a prayer or whether it was just some kind of a ritual, but every single day, the a, a, a good, godly, faithful Jewish person, he would you know, rise up in the morning and he would recite the Shema. The word Shema just literally means here. And that's just the first word of that particular portion of scripture. Because, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, they begin with the word Shema, hear, listen. Okay, so, uh, so they just use that word to describe that entire passage. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9 are called the Shema. And people recite that every day. Uh, at least they used to in those days. And the first word, it begins, Shema, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Listen, O Israel. It begins with that wording. And it goes on to say, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Okay, is what it says. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus quotes this first portion of the Shema. And, um, uh, you know, someone comes to him and uh, they are asking him about which is the greatest commandment and that is when jesus speaks these words um that would be mac matthew no mark mark chapter 12 verses 28 to 30. okay mark chapter 12 um verses 28 to 30. maybe you could just uh, read out 29 and 30. So Jesus also accepted that the Lord is one. Okay. He, he never contradicted that. He never said, you know, no, 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 you know what? I am also God. Like as if he's a separate person. Okay. He did not say it in that way. Like, like as if he's a separate being. He did not say that. He says the Lord is one. So he also accepts the fact that the Lord is one. But you know, right, there are many places where he speaks of himself also as being part of that divinity. Okay, so um, this is what Jesus says about the Father. Uh, maybe we can look at a couple of scriptures. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. If someone could read out Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, please. Look over here uh, who is feeding the birds of the air um, it's your heavenly father who is doing the feeding okay he's feeding them and then a few verses later verse 30 if someone could read out Matthew 6 verse 30 Okay, so over here, in the, uh, just a few sentences later, this heavenly father is also being addressed as God. Okay, so it's like as if these two terms are being used interchangeably by Jesus. In one place, he refers to God as father, and in another place, he just calls him God. Okay, so uh, God the father, in Jesus' mind, God regards the father as being divine. That is how he sees him. But when we look at John 10.30, he includes himself in that Godhood. Okay, John 10.30 is just a few words. Someone could read out John 10.30.
okay so he has uh, he's just made that very very clear he says i and the father are one so in a, you know in, in the matthew passage we saw him referring to um, uh, the father as god god clothes the grass of the field he says so he says that god is divine god the father is divine and now he is saying i and this divine father are one is what he very very clearly says and then we uh, let's look at what jesus says about the holy spirit um, we could maybe look at one verse uh, in connection to that um john 14 16 if someone could read out Okay, so the father uh, would give you another advocate, and now this is something that you might have studied in one of the other subjects, or, or otherwise maybe you're covering this for the first time. Over there, when it says, "I will give you another advocate," uh, that word "another," which is used over there, it is referring to someone who is of a similar type. It's like two apples. You have one apple, and then you have another apple. both are apples both are of the same type it's just, so jesus is saying over here no don't feel bad that i'm going away when i go away another will be given to you but that another will be exactly like me same type so you don't have to feel bad you don't have to feel worried so you know uh, this holy spirit is going to be sent this advocate is going to be sent he will be another exactly like me and so the greek word that is used over there is the greek word allos so uh, in that particular verse you know because of the grammatical construction it would come out as he will give you alon um, you know alon advocate but the, the root word is alos the word alos is basically um, another but of the same type so if i'm holding an apple in my hand you know i you know i would uh, say to you please can you give me alos apple you know so an another apple i already have one apple and now i'm asking you for another one but it's going to be of the very same type on the other hand there's another word that is used uh, you know uh, if you if you want to talk about an another another thing of a different category of a different type then you would use the word heteros you would not use this word allos so uh, let's just look at one example of that matthew chapter 6 verse 24 If someone could read out Matthew chapter six verse twenty four. Mm. So over here, the other that is being talked about, that would be your heteros, and these are completely two different types, two different categories. Uh, uh, the you know the comparison is being made made between God and money. so god is one type of a master money is completely a different kind of master so over here the word heteros is used so it's like as if i'm holding an apple in my hand and i say to you give me heteros fruit so i'm asking you for another fruit but this should not be an apple this should be a separate category so you'll probably give me an orange or an or a mango or, a, or something else okay so when jesus is over here saying the father will send you alos okay alon the father will send you alon advocate he is clearly saying this holy spirit who is going to be sent he is going to be exactly like me is the statement which jesus so because jesus didn't knew his greek he is not mistakenly you know using the word alos instead of the word heteros he clearly deliberately used the word alos to refer to the holy spirit he did not use the word heteros why because the holy spirit and he are both one single being of the same nature okay so they, they are both equally divine so um yeah uh what else can we look at maybe we can look at first corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 Yes, and then First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen. So in First Corinthians three sixteen, we people are you know we believers we are described as being God's. 
temple uh, and that God's Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we are told that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So you have God's temple being mentioned, God's spirit being mentioned. And over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, you have your, we are being referred to as temples of the Holy Spirit. Basically, the you know the terms God and Holy Spirit are being applied to the same temple. So I am a dwelling of God. I am also a dwelling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is fully God. Okay, so the reason that we are looking at all these scriptures is to you know clarify in our minds that yes, all these three persons of the Godhead are fully God. Okay, so. Um, now, looking at just to look at a few verses which talk about the three in oneness, um, the most popular verse that that you know people uh, quote to talk about the three in oneness of God, there is Matthew chapter twenty eight verses nineteen to twenty. Matthew twenty eight nineteen to twenty. If someone could read out. Okay, so let us say I want to ask for three volunteers. And uh, so I would say, you know, I'm going to be calling out three names. You know, I would say uh, Vimal and Francis and Rin. I'm going to be calling out three names. I will not say I'm going to call out three names, Vimal, Francis and Rin, because they're three different persons and they all have three different names. They're three different uh, beings. And so I would say, you know, um, the the worship will be conducted today by these three persons with these three names, Vimal and Francis and Ren. But over here, this baptism is not happening in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you look over there so clearly, it is, you know, the Greek has been translated correctly, and it says over there, the disciples, when they're going to be getting baptized, they're not going to be getting baptized in the names of three. They're going to be getting baptized in the name of one God. So the word over there is name, singular, not plural. The baptism is going to be happening in the name, not the names. Okay, so the baptism is happening in the name of one single God who is in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the baptism is, is not happening in the names of three uh, three beings. The baptism is being done in the name of one single being, who is in three persons. Okay, so um, so that can be your question number one when you go to heaven. You can say, you know, Lord Jesus, please explain this concept to me. Okay, so then He will explain it to you if He believes that that is the correct time for you to have that knowledge. Um, so. Um, we uh, so if you if you uh, okay so that was that was that was Matthew chapter twenty eight verses nineteen to twenty. Can we look at one more scripture? Second um, Corinthians chapter thirteen verse fourteen. If someone could read out Second Corinthians thirteen verse fourteen. Okay, this is one verse that we all know because at the end of every single church service, uh, you know, it ends with this benediction. Now. Some people, you know, they say, okay, you know, when the baptism is being done, you are being baptized in the name, singular name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father's name is coming first in the order, so he must be the greatest. The Son is coming second in the order, so he must be a little, you know, uh, great. Holy Spirit, poor thing, you know, last is coming, so, you know, he's not that great. But then if you look over here in your Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, the order gets changed. So here you have Lord Jesus Christ being mentioned first, and then you have the love of God being mentioned second, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit being mentioned third. So the uh, the order in which they are mentioned is not in any way signifying any kind of ranking. They are equal. They're equal in their Godhead. It's just that in different places, maybe based on the uh, you know convenience of the sentence construction, they are being mentioned in a particular order. 
But just because you have put someone's name first and someone's name second over here in these verses, it is not indicating that one is superior to the other, though no, they are all equal in their uh, you know, Godhead. Um, one is not superior to the other. Now there are some people who kind of want to you know, uh, establish the fact that when you're saying God is one in three persons, you are not contradicting yourself, you know, because they they just they're just good people and they want to you know bring out the fact that scripture does not contradict itself and uh, so you know if someone were to raise the argument and say ah oh, look if you, if you when you open your mouth and start talking about your god already there's a contradiction over there you're saying god is one and then you're saying god is three persons so you're contradicting yourself so these scholars in the goodness out of their you know out of the goodness of their heart they've tried to come up with this explanation of how this um, this statement is actually not contradicting itself. Now, if uh, you know the explanation for that makes sense to you, accept it. If it doesn't make sense to you, leave the explanation. Just by faith, accept the fact that he is one and he is in three persons. Okay, just accept that. Uh, but um, there is an explanation which they tried to give to establish how this is not a contradiction. Okay, so. That would take a lengthy explanation, and I cannot get that get into that you know within the four minutes that we have over here. So maybe we can take a slightly early break. But if we are going to take a slightly early break, we must also come back a little early. So those of you who are going to be logging in, please you know do that by um, okay, yeah, four minutes to ten itself. If you could just log back in, you know we'll continue with uh, with our study of the Trinity. So four minutes to ten. Please, if you can all log back, those of you who are online, those of you who are over here, enjoy your tea, coffee a little early and come back a little early. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Go ahead.